All right. So this uh, mural making toolkit is designed for artists who are interested in adapting your skills uh, to public mural making. Um, so I'm going to start this presentation. And so just a little bit of an overview about what you're going to we're going to try to cover in this presentation is um, this is a company we'll be able to um, give you a toolkit that you can find on our website and download that's going to offer you a comprehensive overview of the mural making process, how to get commissioned, important things to know about contracts, an in-depth look at design challenges that arise in the mural process, and really step-by-step -step instruction on mural making techniques. What's out there, uh, I won't cover everything that's out there, but really the most basic ones, um, including the techniques such as preparation, of uh, designing, coming up with a theme for your mural, um, paint application, sealing the project, and then obviously the funnest part, which is the dedication and celebration of your work. So three parts that I'm going to cover today. The first one is uh, where do we begin? All right. And this is the hardest part, um, especially, well, for me, it's, it's the hardest part. Really, it's a lot of planning and finding the opportunity. So I'm going to cover first why a, why a mural, um, how do these murals start? Where do, where do we find them? Um, how to get those commissions? And then really some simple practices for applying for call, for call for artists and important things to know about some contracts and some legal issues that are related that come across that you'll be probably coming across when you um, start applying for these murals. Um, part two is more about the planning and preparation, the wall, the budget, the design, um, the wall preparation, and then production dedication, which is the funnest part, painting the mural, and then uh, completing the mural and celebrating the mural. So first things first, so where do we begin? And this for me has been, personally has been difficult. Um, I... Like I said, I moved from Philadelphia to Houston and really the opportunities are there. There's national opportunities, there's state, there's local opportunities. Um, and I honestly wasn't very familiar with what was the art world in Houston. Um, I knew what was happening in Philly, but then moving to Houston really felt like I had to start from scratch again. Um, so where do we begin? So first thing is what is a mural? And basically it's just a mural is a large scale um, piece of artwork of artwork that is in a public wall uh, in a public space. Um, there are indoor murals, there's outdoor murals, um, but really the main characteristics are that it's a large scale and that it's shared with viewers. Um, so why do we decide to make a mural? Why not just make a painting of it and to have a camp, have it on canvas. Why do we want to make a mural? So murals really help engage people and can stimulate the dialogue and exchange of ideas and ultimately really make a more dynamic and creative city, which is ultimately what we want for Houston. Um, to improve the visual design, quality, experience of the spaces, and really to foster that connection between community and artists. And that I think is one of the main reasons why I started making murals. I really needed to communicate uh, and to connect with like my community. Um, but a couple of very like universal characteristics of a mural are that murals are familiar, murals are adaptable, murals can tell the story, murals can teach, they can attract, and they also can restore. Um, so when you say that murals are familiar, we're talking about that most people really understand what a mural is uh, and its function in a public space, which makes the project really easy to present to a wide audience. Murals are adaptable, uh, depending on the methods and materials that you use, it means that it, it can be permanent, it can be uh, semi-permanent, or it could be temporary, so they can be adjusted for any community setting. Um, and murals can tell a story. Um, so public art that reflects on lives and experiences, on civic and social um, concerns have a great impact with the community and can really contribute to the local pride. Um, murals can also teach. And I think uh, that is where I have more experience with. Uh, I was a teaching artist for many years um, and it is really amazing how much murals can teach. Uh, from 
people observing you as you're creating the mirrorless, they stop and they ask questions. How are you doing this? Uh, what materials do you use? How long is this mural going to last? Um, really the basics of mural making, but also um, another level of learning of, of the process, of the theme that you're that you're um, what you're really uh, putting on the wall. Like, well, how do you communicate this message? And whatever the theme is, like students get to learn. Students, community members, business owners, everybody really learns. Um, and I, I mean, us as artists really learn too as we are really discovering uh, the community and also discovering whatever theme we're doing. Uh, if it's a social or civic concern that we're doing, we really, it's a great opportunity to really connect with the community. And also the murals can attract. Uh, so an abundance of targeted murals can really aid in boosting the tourism efforts in a community. Um, and also takes me to the next one, which is restore um, not only tourism, but also the economic impact that murals have as they attract people to businesses um, and really enhance communities that are neglected. So what makes a great mural? <laughs> so uh, there are many, many great murals, but there's also some that are might not be so great. So what really, what should we keep in mind when we are making a great mural? So first of all, uh, community participation. You really want to not only include your view as an artist, but really include the community, partners, building owners, students, um, everybody that's going to see the mural, the community in a whole. Um, and encourage the participation in community paint days, on design meetings, uh, to get their input and to um, really teach them how to develop a new skill through painting. So that's why I really love community, community paint days. Um, when you have a high quality and memorable design with a clear message. And what this means is that does the, does the mural, does the message of the mural really come across uh, for everyone? And I'm going to cover this in a little bit in more detail. Um, also murals that are uh, well prepared and well taken care of. So after we create the mural, as artists, we kind of live there, we come back and see it and see what we need to do to it. But um, who's going to care for the mural when we're not there? So uh, when the community is involved, really what happens is that they take pride. They feel like they own it. They participated in paint days. They, they painted part of it. So um, they, they feel like they own it. And so they uh, protect it as much as they can. Um, so really, it takes me to the next point, which is murals that are relevant to the community. Um, I've mentioned be told before, um, murals that um, take into consideration the things that are happening in the neighborhood, um, either highlighting the history of it, um, bringing, uh, like I said, civic, civic pride or social concerns. Um, there really are infinite uh, possibilities of what theme you could explore but really you gotta, very important is to listen, to really listen to the community. Um, murals that are unique and respectful to the side and to local features. Um, so really something that's gonna beautify the community and not really not bring it down. Um, and then that makes help, um, that helps make their neighborhood stronger and obviously safer. Um, so how do we get these mural opportunities? So there are a couple of different things. There's many opportunities, but I try to um, categorize it in this way so that there's artistic processes and then there's um, artist selection. So artistic processes, we're going to cover direct commission, commission projects, and community arts project. And then as far as artist selection, how does the artist get selected um, is the call for artists. And these are a request for qualifications, better known as RFQs, and then their request for proposals, which are RFPs. So first thing, so um, this has happened to me, um, especially when I started making the murals, um, is a direct commission. This is where a property owner approaches you, the artist, or invites artists on his own or vice versa. So if this happens, there are a couple of things that I like to keep in mind. So first thing that happens is that you arrange a meeting with the client where you discuss their vision, their budget, and where the mural is going to be. 
In that same meeting, you can also discuss what the client likes and dislikes, what kind of design they're looking for, what style, um, really what they expect from you um, in this mural. I like to ask questions as to why they chose me, why they contacted me, and it usually is because they looked at previous work and they liked uh, what you did. Um, Obviously, you cannot paint exactly the same mural over again, but some of those design elements could carry on um, to your next mural. Um, so this is why when I come to that initial meeting, I come prepared. I come with my resume, with images of past work. Um, I try to research as much as possible before uh, I go to these meetings. So. If in a phone call, if the initial phone call, you've already asked where the location of this mural is going to be, maybe look into that neighborhood research a little bit more um, or what the business is, what they do. Um, so you can come up already kind of like prepared in your head with a couple of ideas that you could uh, run through the client. Um, also, after this, I like to have a contract, all right? So obviously, you won't have all the information from the beginning, but as you get more before you start designing anything specifically for that side, for that mural, I like to have a contract, uh, a signed contract and a deposit paid before I start uh, doing any design. Um, but when you do that, what I try to do is I try to draft some sketches, uh, design and bring it up to the client. So I usually have a second meeting and I bring some of those designs um, you can bring back that um, in that second meeting, a final design or what you think would be final. The client then kind of brings a couple of, cons if they have any changes or concerns that you want change, um, then you can do so and then bring it, bring it back to them for final approval. Um, it really is up to you how many meetings you want to have before um, the contract is finalized and the design is approved. Um, I try to have one meeting and then one initial meeting and then a second meeting where it's finalized. Um, but be upfront uh, with the client from the beginning about how many design meetings you can you're able to have. But like I said, I recommend uh, no more than three meetings if possible. Um, but once the client is content and he wants to move forward, um, then you. Um, go forward, move forward and start painting the mural. And then at the end, uh, I'd like to do a final walkthrough with a client to make sure everything looks perfect. Um, and then from there, you kind of just make the official handover to the client. So that, that, that was one. That was the client came directly to you. The second one is a commission project. So the commission of an artist for a project promotes artistic excellence, and it usually involves competition. This is where uh, the difference is um, between the last one, the direct commission, and then and then this one. So when I say competition, these come in the form of a call for artists, which are RFQs and RFPs. Um, but in this one, our, a professional artist is paid to conceptualize and create a work of art. And then once the design is approved and the the creation of the work can commence. Um, and in some of these, in some of these cases, which take me to the next one, is that a committee or the community gets involved in selecting the artist. So community arts project, and I mentioned before, this is where I have a little bit more experience than the other ones. Uh, this is where an artist leads and facilitates a, the, the community mural process, all right? Not only the painting of the mural, but maybe community paint days, uh, taking uh, community theme meetings, um, really uh, taking into consideration the community, hence the word, right? Um, so uh, these types of projects are very good in breaking the boundaries and doing team building and cre increasing the creative capacity and also, and most importantly, building that ownership of the community space. So the artists chosen for these types of projects should uh, I guess the most successful community projects are when the artist really is part of the community. Um, you have to be really flexible with these. Um, I've had uh, theme meetings before with community members um, where you're trying to figure out what the best way, uh, the best approach you should take with this wall. And uh, people are going to come at you with 
tons of ideas from I want to be painted with my dog on the wall. I want a painting of um, my nephew who passed away. Many, many, many requests. Your job as an artist is really to listen. Listen to all of these um, ideas and then as a community come up with a decision of what the theme of the meeting of the mural is going to be. Um, so um, really the artist has to have great team building skills, be flexible, um, and then be able to facilitate these activities with a group. You have to be super creative because these groups might be small, they might be large, um, and really uh, be able to mo motivate um, the community. Um, there are also some educational components around painting techniques, historical aspects of the community. Um, it depends on, on what kind of project it is. But a, a project of this nature really takes uh, longer than the other ones. Um, at least two to three months is, is what I think. But think of it, there's a lot of planning to do. Figuring out who your community members are. Uh, if you need to form a committee of, of the community members, who are they going to be? Um, and then deciding which wall is going to be, uh, where the mural is going to be painted, what the theme is going to be. And then really, it's not just you taking the decision now. Um, you have this group of people, this committee, the community, who all of them are going to have input. So that is going to take quite some time to for all of you uh, to come up with a consensus about what the mural is going to look like. Um, so those are kind of like the three uh, main um, opportunities. Um, I mentioned before, like when there is competition. So here comes the question, how do artists get selected? So call for artists, RFQs and RFPs. So RFQs stand for request for qualification and RFPs um, stand for request for proposals. So a call for artists really is going to outline what the proposed site is, the timeline of the project, the total budget of the project. Um, and when you're submitting this proposal, the budget really is um, something that you always have to take into consideration. But there are two ways that this can happen. The first one is a request uh, for qualifications and select requests for proposals. And then the second one that I'm going to cover is the request for proposals only. Now, I personally prefer the first one. Um, what this looks like is it's a three-step process. So the first step for uh, the RFQ combined with the RFP is that the committee and organization releases the request for qualification. It can be on a local, on a regional, or a national scale. So this method really saves the, co the committee a bit of legwork at the beginning. Um, artists send your information. You're sending your qualifications as a public artist such as your resume uh, and images of your work. So what happens after that is that the committee members look at all these applications um, and they narrow it down to usually three to five different artists and then award them the opportunity to uh, send a mural proposal. What's great about this is that at step three, um, you are not designing this mural proposal for free. <laughs> so during this proposal phase, um, it, it really ranges depending on whatever opportunity you're applying to, but it normally ranges between $250 to $500 for your time, your time designing this proposal. So um, at that point, then you really can invest your time. Um, you know that you are getting compensated for the amount of work that you're doing up front. Um, but it is a lot of work. <laughs> so um, within this budget and within the proposal, so the artist needs to factor material costs, the equipment that you're gonna need, travel and lodging, um, and then most importantly, your artist fee. Um, so looking at that, at that budget and being able to stay within those parameters is very important. Um, the artist fee for um, future, future design iterations, thinking about um, you're gonna design the mural, there might be changes, you have to change it again, back and forth. Um, so really that time. Um, but also one important thing that I've missed um, when I'm budgeting my time is researching. You will have to do a lot of research, a lot of planning hours before, um, before you physically start painting the mural. 
Um, so really take all those into consideration. And I'll go over a couple more details that are very important when um, we get to the budget section. Um, but once the proposals, proposals are submitted, uh, the committee then makes a final decision on the winning proposal. Um, so those those are the that's the first one that that's my preferred way. <laughs> the second one is um, a two step process. So it's the request for proposals only. So you jumpstart right into phase two, which is opening for proposals from all artists, again, local, regional and national. Um, also take into consideration the budget, material costs, your equipment needs, traveling. Um, they usually ask for an itemized uh, budget also in this one. Um, and then the artist fee uh, for design iterations, for mock-ups, before you start um, physically painting the mural. So artists are not paid for submitting these proposals. So as they would be in the RFP, RFQ, RFP combination process. So depending on the response, the committee could have a lot of responses, a lot of proposals to review. But once the um, step two is that once the proposals are submitted, the committee makes the final decision on the winning proposal. So there are tons of opportunities out there. Look online, look at the art organization websites um, in either local or nationally. Uh, we'll make sure that we share some links uh, at the end of this presentation for you to find these opportunities. Um, I will cover, I, I say, in my, in my experience, when I do the RFQ combination with the RFP, the one um, I was talking about before, um, I really feel like I have nothing to lose. If they choose me, then that means that they see that I'm great for this project. But if not, then don't be disencouraged. Keep trying. There will be a project that really fits with your professional work. Um, you'll find the right opportunity. So those are the two ways that artists get selected. Now, commission. How do you get this commission? Um, so <laughs> a couple of things that I keep in mind with this is number one and mindset. I think your mindset. This is, I think, the hardest one for me. Um, so your job is the vision keeper of the project. Uh, you, my recommendation is that you don't feel defeated, all right, when you are met with resistance or apathy. You will have a lot of people that really are not artists and maybe don't see um, what your project looks like. They can't visualize it. Um, sometimes even when you write it down and, and share it to them in writing, they just, they just can't visualize it as you, as you do. Um, my advice is to not give up. Keep trying and trying and trying. Um, contact different people, um, different businesses. Always carry that little project with you, uh, that project idea, um, until someone, someone will appreciate it. And just that one person um, believing in your idea is going to make a big difference. Um, really, the the satisfaction or it doesn't come until the end, you know, towards when you're already painted the mural and people see it and they were like, you were right. That idea was great. We didn't believe you at the beginning, but now we can see it. And that happens really, really often. Um, another thing that is very important is to really be specific. So narrow down, decide um, what neighborhood should be activated, should be benefit, can benefit from this mural project. Um, so just have, have the area in mind, be, be really specific. Now, um, not, you might have a wall that you have in mind uh, and that might be rejected at the beginning, but always have a couple of different wall options. I like to have four or five different wall options. I go wall hunting. I look for specific qualities on these walls. Um, I take lots of pictures. I write down addresses. Uh, I do as much research as I can. Now, what usually happens is that I might not get my first choice. I might get my second or third or fourth choice. Um, and then as I continue to make murals, usually wall one will be available for some reason now. Um, so just, just keep a file of all these wall opportunities. Um, and you have, um, I, I just, I write them down and keep a little um, note pad with me all the time in my car and I, I write them down 
Um, and I can always go back uh, to that initial spot that I wanted. Um, now, we're artists. We uh, visualize things. We So my advice with you for this third one is to always lead with images. Sometimes words are not enough. Um, I like... Um, if you're approaching a client specifically with a business, let's just say, um, I like to have photos of the business. I like, I use Photoshop and I use samples of previous work and I just Photoshop it right onto their building. I print it out once they see it in their wall. It's like, oh, this is what you're talking about. This is how amazing it could look. Um, so always, always very, very important to lead with images. Um, and then the next one is practice makes best. I go back to my initial murals and I said, what, would I, what was I thinking? What paint did I use? I have no idea, but it does not look great. Murals have faded. I, I didn't cover them. I was painting on the side of the road without any safety precautions. Um, but now, now I know. Um, and I have to say that you can read and read as much as you can. Um, but really having a, a network of artists, of supporters, of people that do the same thing that you're trying to do is really helpful. I always reach out to peers, to colleagues, um, co college friends, um, to see if they have any advice on, on questions that I might have about how to go about a mural. Now, I did start making murals at my house, my aunt's house, <laughs> you know, friends. Uh, and that really is, is what you do. The, the thing is that the more murals that you make, the more experience you will have about being respectful of the space, about your techniques, and really what works best for you uh, when, when creating a mural. Um, and then the client. So the client is very important. Usually they are not inclined to take risk. They only like sure bets. <laughs> so you can show them pictures, explain how a mural would benefit their business, but then listen. So that is the clue word here. They want to feel like they have a voice in the creation and designing of this mural. Now, like I said, this doesn't mean that you have to paint the owner of the building with their dog. No. So <laughs> you, you got to communicate uh, back and forth, have um, and open dialogues from the initial meetings. Um, more than likely, uh, once they feel like they, be, they are being listened to, uh, they will cooperate. Um, so try to have um, a collaborative approach so that you can align your goals as a win-win-win situation between the community, um, the artist, and the client. So those are just a few things that have worked for me. Um, and then I wanted to also cover some simple practices for applying for uh, calls for artists. These are um, things that you can already kind of have like a format um, or a, a basic document of this information. I'm going to go through each one of these. Um, so we'll begin with a call for artists. So um, with a call for artists, very important to read. Read through it from top to bottom. Uh, so you can understand what the project is, what application materials are expected. And then after you read all this, read again. <laughs> I try to read it two or three times. And then I ask myself as many questions as I can. I write them down and see if I can answer them on research. But things that you should um, take into consideration is, um, is the project something that you actually have interest in? Would you enjoy it? That really is, is what I, the main uh reason what you would do a project. Will you enjoy it? And will the community benefit from it? Um, you can envision a relationship for your work with a project. So I have to say that my murals look very, very different than my paintings. Um, but I've learned to sort of um, find my own way of expressing that my work, my personal work is very abstract. Um, but then um, a lot of my relationship with nature, I would say. But then when I turn into murals and the whole listening part to the community, to what of creating something for a community, not just for me, um, it's also a very teachable moment, I would say. Um, when I make a mural, I try to create activities that I can teach them how to really be in contact with their emotions and with nature and how to express those. Um, so for me, um, 
doing these activities with the community is as rewarding as when I paint just for myself um, to be able to get those emotions out and to be able to express what I'm feeling at that moment. Um, so really, um, can you envision that relationship of your work with that project in some way, shape or form? Um, also, is the budget adequate for a concept that you might develop? Um, you can also um, accomplish the project either individually or part or as part of a team. So that is another option. And that the proposed timeline is feasible for your for your schedule. This is one that I struggle with because I always want to say yes to every project. Um, so one very important thing is to to learn how to say uh, no when when you can't check all these then you got to learn how to say no and wait for the next opportunity. Um, so really reading through all of these is, is very important. Um, writing a letter of interest. So, okay, this is more of like the more tedious work of doing all the writing and all that. So the, the painting is really fun for me, but the writing part um, is what I sometimes struggle with. Um, so I know that when I find um, a call for artists that I want to apply for, um, I need to take my time, as much time as I can to develop all these uh, requirements, everything that they're asking for. So the writing of a letter of interest. So like I said before, maybe this project doesn't interest you and you have to move on. But if it does, uh, and it could be for, very, for many other various reasons, it may not be feasible if you're are partnering with someone else for the project and it doesn't align with, with their views. Um, however, if the project is of interest for you and you believe that it's feasible in the scope, the timeline, the budget, some questions to consider are, why or what about the project is in particularly uh, interest of, to you? Do you have a connection to the community site or project depending on the location of the mural? Have you done other projects that are similar in scale and scope? Um, and then how might your work relate to the benefit of the project? Um, so that that really, um, let me go back. That's, that's really what's important about writing a letter of interest. Now, everything that I'm gonna go through right now, everything that you have to submit for these applications is as you write, read it again, have a friends read it over, always use a language um, that is not, that is a more of a general language, that is not art specific, that everybody can understand it. Um, and just be as honest as you can, be sincere uh, when you're writing this letter, letter of interest. The next one is preparing a draft budget. This will scare you as you go on, as, as more experience, uh, as you do these more with more opportunities. Um, you might be asked to submit a budget for the project, um, the more murals you do, the more you will realize how many things you missed in the, the last one. <laughs> I take notes. Um, sometimes you don't think about travel expenses or um, one that I've missed before is transportation. How do I get all my materials to the site back and forth? Um, and things like that. So we'll cover budget in a second too, but just general things to consider are first and most importantly, artist design fee, the fabrication cost, the installation costs, shipping, travel expense, insurance, engineering fees if needed, and having a contingency plan, all right? Having that money allotted in case something goes wrong, you have that contingency money. Um, so that draft is sort of an, you can do it in an Excel form and I'll show you one in a second too. Um, the other thing that they ask for is images of uh, representative work. So typically a committee will review uh, the artist images first and then scores the artist based on three very important things. So creativity, the quality and technical ability of the work as depicted in the images. So. Hence, your images have to be perfect. So ensure that they're high quality, that they're straightforward, and it's just the artwork. It's not you painting it, it's just the artwork itself. Uh, use a single image. You don't have to include multiple views. Uh, if they're asking for 10 images, try to show them a variety of things that you can do. Um, typically, they ask for very specific uh, image sizes, like one megabyte in size. 
Some tell you exactly the DPI number, pixels, etc. So follow exactly what they're asking for. Um, so follow those guidelines uh, as much as you can. If you need help, I like to sometimes, if I can afford it, to hire a professional photographer to photograph uh, your work. Um, and also, if you if you don't know how to format these images in the way that they're asking, um, ask a friend that knows more. Your artist network, I'm sure someone will be glad to help you with those things. Um, your resume. So this is something that you can work on uh, between one opportunity and the other. So you have it and then just do update it as, as your experience grows. Uh, but just basic, current, brief, relevant resume in a simple format. Uh, no elaborate for fonts, no colors, no images. Um, just edit accordingly. Ask if they need a PDF or a word format and format as, as, as they're asking for, um, which is the next one. So document formatting. So always in your letter of interest, include your name, your address, and your email, and your phone number um, in that first page, that initial page. And then I like in every page that I'm including in my application to uh, write my name. So they are reminded that every time as they're reviewing applications, every time they flip the page over, of who I am so that they get familiarized with my name. Um, and then unless otherwise specified, you should format your document in either a Word or a PDF format, eight and a half by 11 in uh, portrait orientation. So just keeping it really basic, simple and clean um, is really helpful for, for the community. Now, remember that they are maybe reviewing hundreds uh, of these applications um, and you wanna make sure that, that you stand out uh, but that they're also uh, readable and that it's presentable and exactly what they're asking for. Um, and then seven, um, I have here review and renew. So have a second pair of eyes. Uh, I print it out, I make copies, I, I, I read it two days later before I send it over. And sometimes I go back and change a lot of things. So like, what was I thinking two days ago? Now I see these changes. I'm repeating myself here and there. Uh, or if you find little opportunities that you can add things that uh, you can really impress the committee uh, with those words. So um, correct as many times as you can, edit. Um, if you have questions, so um, text me to the next one. So ask for assistance. If you're unsure about any aspects of the call for artists, you can ask the program administrator for clarification. They usually include um, a, an email or a phone number if you have any questions and you can email them my recommendation, don't do it 24 hours before the deadline. Try to do it with as much time as you can. Um, and really it's just for a clarification about aspects of the call for artists, not about formatting images, about uh, um, DPI pixels and things like that. Do not, <laughs> do not uh, contact the program administrator for that. Um, and like I said, follow all these guidelines, exactly what they ask for, um, and you'll have a successful application. Um, this is just a general um, general feedback of, of what they, they could ask for. But like I said, read through it. Uh, read through it a couple of times to make sure you have um, the right format, the, the right uh, amount of images that they're asking. Um, sometimes when you're sending the images, they'll ask for a specific uh, format in the title of the file, in the name of the file. So uh, make sure you look at that too. And then uh, important things to know about contracts and legal issues. So I'm going to run through these fairly quickly. Um, I know Fresh Arts has a lot of resources on their website that go more in depth into some of these things. But just a few things, generalized things to keep in mind when you get a contract or when you're writing yourself your own contract. Um, so they should outline the responsibilities of all the parties involved. Who is responsible for installation, for conservation, for cleanup, storage, and then maintenance. Uh, a description of the artwork, the location, and the anticipated lifespan of the mural. And these can range, I mean, uh, the murals that I would do in Philadelphia were 10 years. I've done recent, some recent ones that um, they only wanted up for a year. And so really reading through your contract um, is very important. Uh, the timeline outlining how long the project will take to complete um, your payment schedule. Um, and that's, uh, I'll, I'll go through all of these in a second too. Uh, liability insurance is something that I had never had to deal with until recently. 
um, I was lucky enough that most of the um, murals that I was doing in Philadelphia, I had a, a program manager, a project manager too. So they would really sort out through all these things. So having a project manager is saves you a lot of headaches, <laughs> but really you should know these things in case you have a private commission that comes up uh, or you don't have access to a project manager and you have to be your own project manager. Um, ownership and copyright, and then maintenance requirements and responsibilities. So um, a couple of questions that I've had uh, when I sent these proposals is, what happens to my idea that I sent afterwards? It didn't get chosen or anything, and, and it's okay, but what happens to that idea? Can I do anything to protect that work that I sent? So um, basic copyright is, copyright is a type of intellectual property that protects original works of author authorship and soon, as soon as the author fixes the work in a tangible form of expression. So um, what that means is that you are the owner of your ideas, but once they're expressed, then um, we go to the next one <laughs> right here. So what is the copyright registration? So copyright really exists automatically in an original work of art uh, once it is fixed. That is, that's, that's the clue word right here. Uh, but it's automatically, I know it was like, should I add the little C logo so that it's copyrighted? Um, your work is, is automatically protected, all right? But if you want to take further steps in case there's some sort of legal um, dispute, a legal issue, uh, then you have to register. Um, I would suggest you register it with um, the copyright in the copyright website. Um, it's not mandatory in the U.S., uh, but registering has its benefits. Um, it's registered as in the national um, database of artwork, um, but it also, um, you need it if it's necessary to enforce the exclusive rights of copyright through uh, litigation. So it's just a, an added step that you could take uh, to protect your work. Um, negotiating a commission contract. I have a hard time with this one, um, and I've learned the hard way um, that contracts are negotiable. It doesn't, it, not because they come up to you with a contract, it doesn't mean that that is finalized and then you cannot make any changes. There are different types of contracts, private, business corporate, percent for art, uh, and then community-based creative placemaking. So yes, your contract is nego negotiable. Uh, you can get assistance. So once you get that initial um, contract, I suggest you read through it a couple times. Uh, if you have questions, make sure you ask those questions. You can also get assistance. You can reach out to lawyers, other artists, friends, local lawyers. Um, there's also a lot of uh, websites that can uh, help you uh, answering any questions that you might have. Um, always, always, always communicate your concerns. Always think ahead through a project and about all the things that come up to come up uh, to make sure that you're prepared for them. I've had some contracts, for example, that um, will tell you, you know, the project needs to be done by this day. And what happens if there's a hurricane? <laughs> what happens if rain doesn't allow me to do it? What happens if I get hurt? Uh, so those are all things that you should keep in mind um, and to make sure that they are added to the contract if they're not there already. Um, usually, uh, the other party, the person behind this document really wants to get this project done. It's someone probably like you that, um, can share those risks with you, uh, and come to an understanding with you. Um, but communication, um, is very important. Um, and then finding the assistance that you need. There are a lot of legal terms and contracts that you might not understand. So it's a good idea to contact a lawyer if you have some of those questions. So artist fees, uh, a payment schedule. I said when you're creating the budget, this is one of the main things that you should look at also included in the contract. So they should be clearly outlined um, on the contract and usually about a third of the project cost uh, should include materials, equipment, permits, and also the insurance. Um, I like to have my payment scheduled clearly outlined in the contracts as the beginning. 
Um, I've done different types of contracts where, you know, when I sign the contract, I get 50%. And then at the completion of the mural, I get another 50%. Um, this is just an example right here of a payment schedule. So let's just say you get 40% upon signing the contract, 30% during the installation phase, 20% upon completion of the mural, and then 10% after inspection. Um, I think the last contract that I did, I, I like, I divided it in three three payments, but things to consider from the beginning is that when you sign the contract, then it's work time. You know, you have to start planning. You have to start ordering supplies. Really, the bulk of that money is needed at the beginning to start ordering all the supplies, um, hiring the help that you need. Um, so having that money, the, the majority of the money up front is helpful. Um, but really, this this can change. Uh, like I said, just voice your concerns. Make sure that you are comfortable with the payment schedule before you sign your contract. So incorporation. So I did not know. I didn't have to deal with this before, um, and it didn't come up until I had to rent a lift um, from a company, from an equipment company, and. It turns out that they won't rent uh, personally. They only rent to businesses. Uh, and I ran into, after I, I contacted one company, I said, well, I'm sure another one will be able to rent one to me. Nope, I was wrong. So that's when I started to have to look up about how, um, how do we do this whole incorporation thing and what is it? So registering the name of your business as a corporate entity is really a process that it now that I look at it, it's very important because it isolates your, isolates your personal assets from your business activities. If anything were to happen, um, then your personal assets will be, would be protected. Um, but really, um, people that can advise you on what kind of business you, um, you should have is your CPA, your accountant, or a lawyer. Ask for that recommendation on your uh, business structure, and then they can determine, help you determine which is the best fit for you. Um, so when you have to choose a name for your business, this is why company names and trademarks are important. So a trademark can be any word, face, symbol, design, or a combination of all these three identifies your goods or your services. So, um, one thing to look at when you're coming up with a business of your name, um, of, sorry, the name of your business, then, uh, what do we know about these names? Is somebody else already using this name uh, or something very similar? So um, you can visit the United States Patent and uh, Trademark Office website um, and they have a database right there. So you can search by terms um, to see if anybody else has already applied or if it's already been used. Um, so that's one very important thing to look at when you're coming up with uh, your business name. And then the other very important thing that happened was learning about insurance. Um, like I said, I had not had to deal with this before. This is all things that I have learned uh, through a lot of phone calls and a lot of headaches. Uh, but most of the public art projects ask you. It, it's required to have a general liability insurance. And even if they didn't, it is a very good idea to have it to protect yourself or protect anybody else the public, uh, the community, from any damage or any accident that could happen um, with connection to your project. So the cost of insurance um, and specifics of the insurance packages will depend on a couple of things. Um, the, the site owner might require specific um, coverage, um, but also could be the nature of your project. So one thing that I like to have is that um, when I have volunteered for, your, for my project or also when I have assistants helping me with a mural, I like to have a uh, volunteer or an assistant waiver form uh, signed by anybody that's going to be painting in my studio, painting on the mural site. Um, so th that's all information that when you call these companies, they're going to they're gonna ask you. So to determine those insurance requirements, uh, agencies will look as... Uh, factors such as like how long is the project going to take, the level of risk, uh, are you going to be using equipment, the number of participants that you're going to have there, um, 
and then the production costs and really um, what the project looks like in general. And they will ask you a lot of questions. I did not know who to go to. So I contacted like my car insurance company and said, you know, I've come up, uh, I need insurance. I'm doing a project, a mural project. And first, the first person I got on the phone was kind of like, I don't know what you're talking about, but let me ask and I'll get back to you. And so sure enough, uh, they found me someone that would cover um, a mural project. Um, so in the contract, it will state what your um, coverage should be. So make sure you have that information. Make sure that you have the addresses where the project is, where you're going to be painting. Um, and then they might ask for some additional information, uh, like I mentioned right here, to determine uh, your insurance requirements. Um, the company that I used, I believe it's called the Hartford, um, and then you pay, pay it yearly. Um, but all of those things should be stated in your contract. Um, also what time and how, how much time should you have that general liability insurance after your mural project is completed. Um, so make sure that you discuss that when, um, outlining your, your contract. Uh, another thing to look for is permits, all right? So depending on the nature of your mural, you might need permits or approvals from the city uh, for installation, uh, traffic, um, and they might have some fees. So also make sure that it's stated in the, in the contract um, who's going to take care of these things. If you have a project manager, it's great. It's really helpful. Um, and uh, another... Um, a couple of resources where you can find other things like that are um, the if you're in Houston, um, the Mayor Office of Cultural Affairs and of Special Events. So everything from where you're going to place the art, if it has logos, if it's branding, if it's considered advertisement, uh, and any events that you're going to have sort of like dedication or celebration at the completion of the mural. Um, so these are things to keep in mind. Um, and then after installation, I've had questions like, well, who's going to take care of the art afterwards? What if uh, it it gets damaged? What if uh, there's a hurricane? Uh, I, I don't know. There are many, many things that could happen um, to a work of art. So having that initial conversation to make sure that you include it in the contract is, is there a conservation plan? Um, if something were to happen after your mural is completed, um, my advice is to reach out to your networks, your lawyers, look at that contract again, read it again to make, uh, to figure out what you're responsible for. Um, but always, always, always be responsive. Don't ever try to just ignore it. It's not gonna go away. Uh, just be a responsible adult and be responsive. Um, Another thing that I've learned is that when you hire other people, subcontractors to do um, help you install the work, or um, if you need engineers or landscaping done, um, to make sure that your subcontractors, uh, subcontractors uh, can guarantee the same uh, thing that you are responsible for, because really um, you, you, you will have to respond for them. Um, so those are just some things to keep in mind. So liability, so what happens if someone gets hurt during the dedication? Um, what happens if a year later, uh, one of the panels flies away and there's a car accident? I don't know, <laughs> things can happen. So it's best to always have that liability insurance. Um, it is worth really holding that liability insurance to cover anything that might happen afterwards. But check also um, with the business. If it's in a business, they might already have a liability insurance that would cover such instances. Um, but really, just just ask um, and keep in mind that really this liability insurance will, will protect you, is there to protect you. 